Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, we would like to tell you all that we have started a very new series on performance analysis of computing system and under this series we have conducted a session also. Friends, continuing our series further, today we are going to talk on basics of performance analysis and modeling and for this discussion on the topic, we have with us in our studios Dr. Adwitya Sinha. Dr. Adwitya Sinha is Assistant Professor and she is teaching in one of the leading institutions of the country. Friends, Dr. Advita Sinha has immense experience as well as knowledge and through this live platform, she believes her giving most knowledge to the students. Friends, if you want to ask questions from Dr. Advita Sinha on today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. I repeat our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. Now I would like to welcome our guest Dr. Advita Sinha and would like to request her to continue the lecture so that uh, she uh, could give you maximum knowledge and you could get maximum knowledge through her. Hello ma'am welcome to Hello. the lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so viewers uh, in this lecture series on performance analysis of computing systems uh, in continuation to previous topics, we'll introduce uh, some more basic um, tools and technologies and some more arenas that are associated with evaluating and analysis uh, of performance of computing systems. So in this lecture, we would mainly go through the performance metrics as we were uh, uh, introduced some of these topics uh, in the last lecture also and we will be revisiting uh, what are the good uh, perf performance metrics that is uh, what are the good characteristics and then uh, the techniques that are available that is when we, will, we are going to choose modeling or simulation or any other experimentation technique. Uh, then uh, certain do's and don'ts that are associated with uh, evaluating performance and then uh, the error analysis, which is very important uh, in, in every perspective actually, but when it comes to evaluating the performance of a particular uh, system, uh, be it computing system or electrical or electronic systems, like uh, any that uh, system that makes our task easier. Uh, so error analysis would in, uh, include certain uh, things like the accuracy, the level of accuracy, what type of precision we are um, desired for in context of a particular, uh, say, for example, application context. Then uh, the biasness, how much biasness is allowed and is restricted. It also includes uh, the types of errors and we'll also go on measuring the relative error when we don't have the true value. The true value is very important to keep track of the pattern of the error that is there in the results okay but in there are certain cases where true value becomes very difficult to predict or to have so in that case we go for relative errors so starting with the performance metrics part the first thing is what is the concept of performance metric this is the uh, this could be like a measuring uh, parameter that allows you to uh, just to find out how good the system is working, uh, what its functional lifetime, uh, how uh, the oper operational uh, system would be with respect to certain other parameters like the speed, the throughput, uh, whatever it, it could be the responsiveness of the system, etc. So uh, some of them could be the absolute number a service uh, that has been carried out during its functional lifetime. Then the time taken to perform a service because lesser is the time taken to perform a service, more will be the responsiveness of the system and the system would become free from uh, the present job and it will get itself engrossed in some other uh, works. Also the user would be satisfied uh, at the front end and uh, it could be the size of the resources also. The resources are dynamic in nature or it is static or whatever it could be the number of users that is uh, the scalability part whether the uh, more number of users can get associated with the system as uh, time advances or the stage of uh, development uh, advances. Okay. So here, uh, what are the different choices uh, that we have that affects our, uh, the performance of our computing system? One could be that while the performance is being judged, uh, what type of values we are taking in? Like 
the input that we are taking, whether it uh, they are the values, the discrete values uh, altogether, or some kind of uh, say random uh, distributions are there, or we are doing some kind of probability derivation or any functional derivation. Okay, so or it could be something like uh, it might not be a particular value, or it might not be even from uh, the probability probabilistic uh, say the distribution part but it could be some values that are normalized on a given scale okay because when we are normalizing a value on a given scale then uh, what we are doing we are actually um, analyzing different inputs and uh, bringing them on a same a common uh, platform or a common range so that the comparison becomes easier okay and uh, obviously the analysis would be even more fairer then comes uh, the choosing of an appropriate performance metric okay how how do we choose it will depend upon obviously the goals of our performance study that um, uh, that is purely context based um, or the application and obviously the an analyst viewpoint part okay so goals will be important and what else the maximum cost that is incurred in developing that particular system now this cost is a little ambiguous uh, term this cost could be the programming complexity the programming that it supports or it could be like uh, what type of hardware make it is the configuration part uh, whether the hardware make is um, like recent enough to support uh, to be compatible with the recent software to the recent upgrades or it is like uh, has become like uh, old enough to adjust with whatever technology that has been coming up these days okay now let's go through some of the commonly um, used metrics as um, that are uh, particularly uh, deployed for um, measuring the performance of computing systems okay the first one is uh, clock rate clock rate uh, is normally used for uh, say the performance it's it's often the frequency of the processor's central clock okay so it could be the uh, wall clock also the global uh, system clock that helps to synchronize all the processes all the functions or it could be all uh, the modules of a particular uh, uh, you know computing system and uh, it uh, fairly it knows how much computation is uh, actually being performed in this part and it is uh, repetitive it's very easy to measure because it, it is one of the benchmark metric that is uh, there uh, Uh, employed for um, uh, analysis of the performance of a system and uh, it is mostly it is non linear it cannot simulate it cannot uh, accommodate it cannot go with the uh, uh, real world behavioral traits okay so we can say that it is not very much uh, to rely with then we have uh, mips it's a very prevalent one uh, which means uh, millions instructions per second okay so it's going to be uh, the measure of the amount of computation that is being performed with respect to whatever time unit we have taken it could be per nanosecond or m microsecond or whatever the second okay and uh, obviously it is again very easy to measure because only uh, uh, the instructions the number of instructions has to be counted it has to be kept track of and uh, what else uh, the execution time of a single instruction we assume again that uh, the instructions are all uniform in nature and each instruction that is being carried out uh, the time that is uh, that that particular instruction is taken is fairly uniform unless otherwise specified this is again non linear in nature and therefore not much reliable as uh, the clock rate okay and obviously not uh, consistent why because we have taken this assumption that all the instruction execution time is fairly uniform which uh, doesn't happen that way okay so it's not um, uh, it, it won't be able to give you a very correct uh, measure and uh, and uh, what else it will obviously differ um, uh, according to the architecture that is being supported by the computing system okay it could be risc or cisc so as this platform uh, differs uh, uh, what will happen your uh, mips will give results that vary from one system to another okay next is flops flops uh, stands for floating point operations per second okay so we have mega flops giga flops these days teraflops 
Now, uh, this very much helps to define the arithmetic operations uh, because um, most of the arithmetic operations become uh, meaningless when if you are not dealing with the floating point operations. Okay, so uh, it uh, helps to keep track of how much uh, such type of arithmetic operations are being carried out. Okay, so uh, whenever we have some integral applications, these um, metrics come uh, quite handy. It is repeatable and it's easy to measure. It is again nonlinear in nature and is inconsistent. Okay, then we have spec, another upcoming standard. Uh, this is used mainly for uh, the collection of uh, specified benchmarks like there are uh, several measures that are available specific to the system architecture. So a collection of such uh, uh, fair enough whatever metrics are there that, that are developed for a hardware or software specific uh, requirements of a particular system they are being combined as the modules uh, make up the system. So say a particular module is equipped with uh, or is uh, like okay with a particular uh, type of performance metric, uh, performance benchmark metric. So they are just collected and this collection is uh, used for, it can be like aggregated to just uh, form a, um, another metric. Okay. So these were the very prevalent ones that were prevalent actually uh, when uh, we do not have these type of today's uh, fast computers. Okay. Uh, another such metric is quips that is quality improvement per second uh, this was this is also again a quite traditional approach and uh, not relevant uh, these days but what is quite prevalent uh, these days include mean time between failures the execution time supportable load speed up scalability etc so you can see that what happens when we are going from the traditional um, uh, conditions to these days, we are not restricted ourselves to those that are uh, like platform independent or say application independent. These days according to the application, the uh, performance metrics are being generated. Okay? So it is not that uh, if we are going for uh, say flops or spec or uh, quips or clock rate because these are quite traditional, they are uh, platform independent can be applied anywhere. The applicability part is good, but when it is, uh, it comes uh, specific to a particular application's uh, capacity or a constraint uh, that are there associated with the hardware, then this type of uh, metrics they become quite uh, obsolete. So the, these days, uh, the very general ones that we have is response time. Uh, the throughput, the response time which is very um, important one, a very uh, prevalent one these days and again it, it can be adjusted according to the applications requirement. Okay. So it is what, it is basically the time interval measured between a user uh, placing a request and the system responding back. Okay, so this is this has nothing to do with uh, uh, you know it's it's not taking into account that um, or assumptions uh, that are fairly uniform across all the platforms or something like that. It could be specific to that particular hardware on which the response uh, time is being uh, calculated. Okay, so here we can see that the response time, if it is small, why it is good from the user point of view, from the system point of view, why it is uh, good for the user because they had to wait less. And why it is good for the system because now it has got free to do other things. Okay, so uh, it means that when the system is free, it can be scheduled. The duty cycling can be done in a uh, fairly different uh, and uh, optimized way. Then the throughput. Throughput is what? Uh, it's a number of work units that is done per unit time. Okay, so uh, this is again a very relevant metric uh, that can be used um, over any application or any files being transferred or any type of packets being communicated etc. Okay, so high throughput is always um, the goal that is to be achieved. For the system why it is important because it is able to serve many clients okay, and why for the user because it implies, uh, it might imply worse service that is the user can uh, give feedback on the basis of the throughput it can report back to the uh, service center or to the programmer or to the, whoever is there in the back end of the uh, system management part. 
Okay. So, uh, if we take a very, very like uh, traditional example of how to calculate throughput, it could be MIPS. And last, uh, the system utilization. It is what the, uh, the percentage, the measure of the, uh, the time that the system is busy doing the service part. It is imparting service. Okay? So, uh, this could be like uh, important for the systems that are uh, shared in nature. Say they have a common pool of resources and these resources are being shared among various applications or it can be shared among various users. Okay? Uh, so, it is something like a bottleneck uh, pool. Okay, of resources. So, uh, how uh, such resources are being utilized, whether th those uh, resources are being uh, like, um, uh, uh, they are given f fair um, access to all the users or the access is being restricted or um, something like that. Okay. And uh, what else? Uh, the utilization and response time, these are very much uh, interrelated in concept. Okay. Why? Because uh, if we have high utilization of any system, then this is going to affect the response time as well. So, we have to keep a trade-off, a good balance between all the metrics. We have to choose the metrics uh, properly so that our uh, overall system performs in an optimized manner. Now, the characteristics of the metrics. Okay. Uh, like we have chosen so, uh, certain metrics uh, for um, analyzing a particular computing system. Okay? Now, if uh, the choice of the system, uh, choice of the metric uh, is not as per the system's uh, goal, then what would happen? We would get an output, we would get a, 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 a certain kind of measure, but they would not comply with the working of the system. We would not be very much uh, like uh, interested to have those metrics. So, it is very important to know the characteristics of good performance metrics. The first thing is the easiness of measurement. It should not have too much uh, complications or overhead on the computation part. Okay? Because uh, if it is very much complicated, then it will not be very easy to measure. The measurement itself, the analysis itself would take so much time that the system will uh, like cross the prototype stage and it will get deployed. So, we have to keep the metrics in such a manner uh, to ex so that their execution do not take much time or their execution is uh, not much complicated in um, delivering the results, the comparative results. Next is the consistency. Consistency is what the unit of measure and its precision, it, the definition of these two things, they must be like uh, same across different configurations and different systems. It means that whatever metric we choose, it should be uh, like same for the systems that are or say for the applications that are being running over uh, sort of hardware that, that, that are uh, sharing the same kind of configuration. Also, it has to be independence. Uh, it means that commonly used metrics are often used for decisions to select a particular system. So, whenever we are talking about uh, good metrics, it means what? It should be independent from the intervention from vendors to the influence of the composition of the metric to their own benefit. Okay? So, these three things, easiness, the consistency and independence, that one metric, it should not happen that uh, the metric dependencies, interdependencies are so much that you cannot trigger uh, a particular metric on a computing system to get the output. So, these three uh, important characteristics must be there associated while making uh, a choice of a particular metric. Now comes uh, the evaluation and the analysis technique. Now, we have uh, broadly speaking three types. The first is modeling, simulation and the third one is measurement. So, we have to decide when uh, we are interested to go for uh, the modeling part when we should jump into uh, simulation because uh, simulation is kind of uh, analysis technique that cannot be used uh, for any system. Like uh, whenever we are developing a certain sim simulation model, it means that we have a kind of computing system that uh, demands or that has a requirement in which the input size or the sample size or any deciding parameters 
their size is uh, quite big and it has to get simulated. Often when we do the experiment part uh, through measurement or modeling, what happens? We uh, take a small example and uh, we take some uh, values over the over the uh, that particular problem and we check its output. Now, when the input size becomes very large, it becomes difficult to do it on the manual part. Also, uh, since you don't know whether that particular uh, measurement will work is valid or not, uh, so you won't risk it to test on the actual system. So, in such cases, simulation comes quite helpful. But when the uh, input size is small, the sample size is like quite uh, like uh, it can be doable on the manual part or um, say uh, with the help of ideal mathematical models, etc. So, in that such situations, we do not um, take simulations into account. So, as uh, um, uh, compared to simulation, we have modeling. Modeling is what? Modeling is like it is very much uh, dependent upon the mathematical concepts. Mathematical concepts of maybe the, uh, how the particular variables values are being distributed or how the uh, variable is uh, in putting its impact on the computer system. Or it can be say um, like if, if we are uh, applying analytical modeling on the wrong uh, say incorrect model of uh, a particular computer system, it could give you incorrect results as well. What happens in a computing system, there could be um, multiple modules okay? and these modules could be at different stages of development. So, say for example, we have taken up a model, uh, say uh, the module within that computing system that is still on its uh, prototype uh, uh, phase, then what happens? Um, in that phase, uh, we can actually do the mathematical modeling part because we uh, through mathematical models, we are actually what we are getting, we are getting the ideal results from the uh, mathematical distributions, from the probabilistic distributions from uh, say statistical analysis, we are whenever we are getting the values, they are all statistically correct. They are so ideal that obviously they are not going to uh, comply with the real world. So, uh, we have to choose this uh, very uh, like appropriately that what on what type of model we would apply modeling, otherwise it would become inaccurate. Okay. And uh, the last but not the least is measurement. Measurements are normally applied when the system is like uh, on a fully functional phase and, um, uh, and its performance in terms of several metric, the speed uh, or um, uh, buffer capacity or any other constraints, they can be measured with certain meters. Okay? So, these are the three things, uh, three techniques rather through which we can choose what type of analysis or we can say what mode of analysis uh, we are going to choose while analyzing the performance of systems. Okay, now, uh, this is a tabulated uh, compar comparison between analytical modeling and uh, simulation and measurement that you can see. Uh, here we have taken um, different criterions, uh, one is stage execution time, the tools that are required. In context of all these, the level of accuracy, if the le level of accuracy, uh, if you are taking modeling part, okay, the system is still on the design phase. So, in that case, if um, uh, modeling is applied, how the accuracy will get affected? Uh, it would be low or high like that. Okay. Again, if you are taking simulation, then accuracy would be quite moderate. It will depend upon in which stage that uh, system is presently. So, the complexity will decide uh, what type of level of accuracy would be achieved. In measurement part, for level of accuracy, you can see that uh, it will uh, definitely it will vary according to the real um, time environment. Okay. Like uh, the real time parameters uh, are so dynamic, they might uh, impact on the computing system as well and their performance might get um, affected in a positive or negative manner. Again, uh, there are so many other uh, factors are there, say for example, the cost involved. Okay, uh, In case of measurement, the cost involved is very high because we are doing it on the actually deployed systems. 
so high cost why because uh, installation will uh, incur a certain cost uh, over it simulation uh, would incur less cost and uh, when we are uh, dealing with the modeling part modeling is uh, like pure mathematical uh, derivations and uh, we are relying on the statistical outcomes so it's all about calculations uh, or uh, at most there would, could be some programming so um, any such hardware related cost are not much incurred okay so these are uh, the different ways in which you can make a comparative uh, study between the evaluation and analysis techniques when seen from a uh, viewpoint of different criterion so which could be stage or execution time or accuracy etc okay so moving ahead these are uh, some of the common flaws that are associated uh, while um, doing a performance analysis uh, thing the first is on the basis of goals okay say for example the goals is are not fixed or there are no goals at all or uh, the goals are biased towards a particular um, maybe a particular application or a bias towards a um, particular type of um, system configuration which should not be or uh, one more case could be the problem say the problem is not defined we have the application we have the system that is to be deployed for a particular application uh, for uh, making the tasks uh, related to a particular application easier but we are not aware of what type of problem it should uh, address so goals um, on these three contexts are quite important they are of uh, prime importance so it has to be dealt with the second is methodology methodology uh, how the flaws could be there uh, it could be um, unsystematic method methodology the methodical approach that is, that are being applied they might not be in a proper uh, ordering or say on a proper sequence as we know that uh, when we are doing some sort of programming also uh, so our programs have so many functions in it right so uh, we have to decide that which function should call uh, which another function whether uh, two three functions they are um, related in some manner they are dependent uh, on each other on some manner or they can be carried out in parallel okay so be it uh, sequential or parallel programming we have to keep track of which method to be triggered when and on what modules then uh, uh, the incorrect metrics obviously we have seen the characteristics of a good metric and um, vice versa the bad metrics so we have to be very um, uh, choiceful of uh, what type of metrics will take into account the wrong techniques bad experiments they are all part of methodology then it could be completeness uh, overlooking the parameters or ignoring certain uh, implicit or explicit factors that affect the system it could be the analysis uh, also the analysis that uh, we were just um, explaining that uh, it should not be very much complex the overhead should not be that much that um, it it's consuming more time and effort um and also the presentation part presentation part has to be very important because uh, if your assumptions are not correct the presentation will be completely flawed so for as of now this much thank you with this note thank you ma'am thank you so very much for uh, this productive session friends we will be back after a short break and would we'll be discussing more so be with us
Hello friends, welcome back to this session where we are discussing on the basics of performance analysis and modeling and for the discussion we have with us in our studios, Dr. Adwit Vesena. Friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Adwit Vesena on today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. Now, I would like to request to Dr. Adwit Vesena to carry forward the lecture. Yeah, sure. So now that we have done with the common flaws that is associated with performance analysis, now we'll move forward to the error analysis part. Okay, errors are uh, the things that should not be propagated uh, more into more number of uh, stages because that way the errors would amplify themselves and the results that we are hoping for will get completely incorrect and uh, imprecise. Okay. So, what type of uh, errors, um, the building blocks say for example, uh, would be there when we are doing an analysis of performance, keeping in mind that there could be errors also in our study. So, the first thing that we have to address is the accuracy. Accuracy, which is a very prevalent term that we use, uh, that, that is uh, associated with any computational um, uh, like system, be it a calculator or a supercomputer. Okay, so what it is, it is a degree to which measurements tend to deviate from the true value. Okay, now what is true value? True value is something like uh, ideal behavior of a system. Okay, the system that um, uh, it, it, should, it should behave in an ideal manner. Okay, so from there the whatever the ideal value comes that we call a true value. Okay. So, um, but actually what happens, there are so many uh, negatively um, impacting uh, parameters that could be implicit parameters of, or explicit parameters on the system, okay, uh, or it may, may be due to programming improper methods that we have just seen, uh, the flaws, okay, or it could be maybe the overheating of the hardware um, uh, parts, etc. So, it, it will not work according on the ideal lines. The system will never work on the ideal lines, though we would uh, tend to achieve that ideal behavior, but it would not uh, behave in an ideal sense. So, in that case, when we know that we cannot achieve that ideal behavior, we have to keep track of uh, to what degree this deviation is happening from the true behavior or uh, true value. So, this is your accuracy. Now, uh, let us come to precision. Okay, though uh, precision and accuracy, they are uh, almost treated as uh, synonymous, but uh, you can see that these, they, they are not actually the synonymous, synonymous terms. Okay, precision is what? It is the ability to provide or uh, you can say to produce multiple estimates that appear near to each other. Okay, so say for example, a particular experiment is being executed number of times and if the result that you are getting is different every time. That might be okay, but uh, the, dis the difference between each of the output, whether it is too much or it is like within certain limits. If it is within certain limits, within certain say hysteresis is defined, uh, then it is called the system is uh, tend to be like precise. Okay, it's precisely we, we often say uh, precisely saying. Okay, it means what that we can uh, give pr uh, multiple estimates, but these estimates itself, uh, mu these multiple it estimates itself, they are very near to each other. Okay, they 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 somehow or other they comply with each other. So um, in, in in a word, we can say that uh, it's a measure of random deviations from the true value. Okay. So now uh, accuracy is what it's a measurement just just one measurement from the true value. Now if we are uh, taking up multiple uh, outputs and then we are comparing the outputs uh, together uh, with each other, then we will say that whether the series of outputs uh, they are uh, uh, on uh, within certain threshold or not. Okay, so that that way we will then uh, uh, can uh, coin this term precision. Okay. So, it is not always true that uh, a system um, or a result that is accurate is also precise. Now comes the biasness. What is bias? It is basically the difference between the center of the estimates and the center of the true or target value. Okay? Uh, we somehow if we are uh, finding out uh, the center of the estimates or the average of the estimates and then we are comparing it with the true value. Uh, and uh, 
if the difference is like uh, too much or uh, too less according uh, to what the system would uh, prefer, and then this need to be regulated and monitored. The systemic, systematic deviation of values from the true value is what biasness is. And uh, it, it is always, um, uh, it's helpful for giving a systematic error analysis, okay. So, having a, a good acquaintance on uh, accuracy, precision and biasness, let us move to an uh, example so that it would be easier for you to understand on how to analyze error uh, before analyzing the performance itself. Okay? So, uh, we have taken a shooting target example. Okay? Uh, there are four cases, case A, B, C and D. So, uh, the shooter is uh, shooting um, on the target and you can see that case A, it seems like very successful and we can say that A exhibits accuracy of highest order, okay. Comparatively uh, with other cases obviously. Uh, and in case B, what happens that in case B, though the shooter is not able to shoot at the targeted point, the core, the, the center point, but its um, tendency to shoot is somehow precise because um, the way it's he is marking the points is uh, those points are very much nearby to each other. It means that that particular shooter has uh, some kind of uh, pattern in his uh, shooting. Okay, the shooting pattern uh, is there. There is a pattern um, over which uh, the next uh, the next point on the target plate could be like uh, predicted. Okay, so, we can say that the um, case uh, that we can see in, in the B part, it is quite precise or we can say that it is consistent with the other results. But obviously, B lacks accuracy because it is not shooting uh, the shooter uh, in case B, it is not shooting on the core part. Okay, so, the correctness or exactness is lacking with B. In case C, what happens? Accuracy and precision both are lacking. Because uh, the target, it seems that the shooter is randomly just uh, going on shooting on the um, target plate and there is no pattern being followed and also um, the, the core is not being hit. Okay? What happens in the D part, case D? D lacks precision as you can see and C and D, we can say that they both are imprecise. Okay, there is no consistency in the results in case C and D. In a manner, if we want to do a comparison, a tab tabular comparison on this, we can see that with A, there is no biasness. Okay. Uh, precision is very high because they are, the results are all interrelated. Accuracy, no doubt, uh, seeming less, uh, like uh, it is very high. And in case B, what happens? Biasness is high, okay, but accuracy is very low. Similarly, you can see uh, the case as in target C, there is no biasness because the, the um, output that you can see, the targets, uh, the points, they are all like uh, distributed almost like evenly on the plane. There is no pattern being followed there is no accuracy so and there is no biasness also biasness means that if you are finding out the average of all these points it's like giving you a very uh, a vague vague value okay uh, that value is no way uh, helpful for you to analyze or predict the error pattern or something you cannot predict on this particular uh, taking the biasness in case c you cannot predict the next uh, where the next target would be okay so, um, there is no bias, uh, it is completely unbiased. What happens in D? D biasness is moderate because it is a little towards um, one part, okay? but, but still uh, the precision and accuracy both are quite low. So, from this comparison, I think uh, you ha have got a fair idea of what biasness is. Um, uh, and it is not always true that if some system uh, is accurate, it is also precise. Okay? So, these are the measures uh, by which you can analyze the error. Now, uh, let us understand the types of error. Okay? Errors could be of different types, be it numerical or non-numerical. 
its significance uh, or, or its propagational significance, we must say, cannot be um, like we cannot neglect their uh, propagational significance because if there are small amount of error, even some 10 to the power, some minus uh, 6 or 7 like that, even uh, if such error is propagated through uh, several uh, mathematical sequences, several developmental stages, they tend to magnify. And as um, the stages propagate, the errors also propagate through the stages. Okay, so it has to be um, taken care of at the very initial stage. And uh, whenever we are choosing any uh, particular method, we have to find out that whether um, error is associated with it or not. Normally, errors are associated, but the more important thing is that we have to take care of how much error. What is the magnitude of the error? What is the uh, span of the, the scope of the error, the propagational uh, speed with which the error would uh, tend to get propagate when the developmental stages expand. Okay. So, uh, starting with the non-numerical errors, it could be several types. First is modeling error. It could be generated by wrong assumptions. Okay. As um, in the flaws also we have seen that uh, assumptions are very important assumptions, initial values, uh, the initial ranges, default ranges, these are equally important uh, to take care of. So, if uh, the assumption itself are wrong, it is something like that the base over which the performance has to be analyzed of a computing system are um, like incorrect. So, uh, it comes under the modeling errors. Second is system constraints. System being developed on the hardware and um, um, software part. So, uh, it can be there can be chances that the hardware and the software are not compatible to each other. They might have certain limitations, maybe the hardware has certain incompetences and it is not able to support the upgrades uh, of the software that is uh, required, maybe. So, these are the system constraints uh, and these constraints are uh, no way they are going to um, have some numerical contribution towards the error analysis part. Okay. Next is uh, data or information uncertainty. If you have ambiguity, the data stream itself. Say we have taken an example of um, a small algorithm because the algorithms they make up the modules and the modules together they make up computing systems. So, why not um, take a very small example of say uh, sorting algorithm. Okay. So, what happens in sorting algorithm if the data that is uh, say the data set or the arrays of numbers that are being supplied to the, uh, the uh, algorithm is not compatible, is not uh, um, uh, confirming to the type of data input that should go into the array, uh, the uh, algorithm part. Okay. So, we have to take care of what type of input it has to be given. Say we are sorting a particular um, say integral array, say for example, 100 numbers are to be required. 100 Instead of 100 numbers, if the user has given uh, some alphanumeric characters also, then in that case what happens? The sorting would be unfair. It would be incorrect and uh, you, no way you can blame them as uh, numerical errors. Okay. So, these are all numerical or uh, non-numerical errors. There could be uh, incorrect choice of performance metric also. Okay. In sorting, if you are um, just say for example, uh, finding out uh, the communicational delay, it would be wrong. Right? We have to find out the complexity in state, we have to find out the computational uh, delay also would be fine, but communicational delay would be like vague. So, the choice of metric is uh, quite important. Then there are methodical blunders. What are this? Uh, if uh, we have uh, uh, chosen certain functions or methods that are inappropriate in the context, uh, in that particular applications context. Okay, in that particular uh, analytical uh, viewpoint, uh, so uh, it is going to give you certain errors uh, or the, the type of errors that you will get, it, it will be very difficult to keep track numerically because they are all non-numeric errors and there could be some common errors also from the human part, from the user entry part. Okay. So, these are all uh, non-numerical errors. Now, let us see what numerical errors could be. Numerical errors could be the rounded off errors, the truncated errors, the propagation errors, 
and the approximation errors. Now these are the errors uh, whose um, tendency of propagation if we uh, can track them we can find out the pattern of the errors and these errors can be um, eradicated uh, in the time being. So starting with the first one the rounded off error. This happens due to limited number of significant digits. Okay, uh, rounding off uh, as we all know that it is uh, normally done um, in a way that if the digit is uh, more than 5 or 5 or more than 5 it is uh, taken to the higher ceiling value otherwise to the lower ceiling value it is being taken. Truncation is rather simpler it is just the uh, if the number of digits are given to you that um, say for example 4.255 6 is given a number is given to you and you have to truncate it to 2 digits only are required then you are just chopping off the value 6. So it, uh, the remaining is 2.55 but if you are rounding it off since 6 is a value more than 5 so the value that you will be remained with is 2.56. So this are the common ways in which uh, you can uh, like uh, discard the um, uh, you know excess uh, decimal digits okay. And uh, what else? The propagation errors, yes. Uh, this happens due to sequence of operations. When we are doing a particular kind of operation again and again in a sequence, then uh, be it rounded off, uh, be the error comes uh, due to rounding off or due to truncation, it, there is a tendency that it will propagate and it would magnify rapidly. However, these types of errors can be reduced with uh, certain uh, computational order, certain choice of computational order um, uh, and stable manner of discarding digits after the decimal. And uh, this can be obviously when this type of uh, uh, like treatment is done, uh, choice of uh, computational order proper um, and discarding the digits, what, what would be the policy for discarding the digits. Say if for example, if we are doing some, some kind of uh, uh, mathematical operations in a in an algorithm or any say module or system at large, then if uh, uh, we are truncating, then we have to truncate throughout. If you are rounding, rounding off um, uh, the mathematical operations, if you are doing a rounding off operation, then rounding off should be done throughout. If somewhere we are doing a truncation and somewhere rounding off, then there would be ambiguity in the results and it will be very, very difficult to track. And the propagation speed of those types of errors, uh, they would be uh, very much difficult to track and it, it will spread uh, very uh, like uh, rapidly. So uh, if this type of care is taken off, then um, analysis and prediction of error can be done to some to a certain manner. Then uh, the mathematical approximation errors. There are so many approx approximation methods that are there. Uh, approximation methods are normally employed when the computational power or computational efficiency or we can say the processes efficiency is not that much that a particular um, algorithm could be executed, a, a, a particular method could be like uh, executed for long enough to get um, uh, say uh, converged to a particular result. So when convergence becomes very difficult to achieve on the present processor speed or capacity, uh, then uh, in that uh, case approximation uh, mechanisms are applied and they, uh, they are in form of uh, like different, they could be statistical in nature or any methodical in nature. So in that case also approx approximation also gives you certain errors. So uh, these are the types of numerical and non-numerical errors. Now let us see how to measure uh, these errors. There are many ways to measure uh, but we will take a very small example, the, a very basic one rather, measuring the relative error. Okay? So first we will take up a case in which measuring of the error uh, when the true value is known, that is the true nature of the system is known, the ideal behavior is known and uh, we will also take up a case in which the true uh, nature of the system, the ideal uh, behavior of the system is quite um, like it, it cannot be predicted. We are not aware of what is, what is the true state or true uh, value given by a system. So firstly starting with measuring of the relative error. Now defining error first. Error is what 
it is obviously uh, the difference between the computed value and the true value. In many books you will find out that this error is taken as a modulus so that the negative and the positive impact of the result can be neglected. You can do it either ways. So error is what the difference between the correct value and the true value. Now comes the relative true value. Okay, because why why we go for relative true value? Because we are interested to find out the error uh, that uh, is with respect to the error associated in the true value. Okay, because uh, just like that, if you are calculating the correct and the true value, you will get a, a particular uh, like measure. But when you are comparing this measure with the true value, then you will get uh, a kind of um, a percentage measure or a fractional measure of uh, defining how the error is moving uh, towards the positive line or the negative line or where you have to put the uh, like uh, uh, checkpoints so that the errors can be the propagation of the errors can be restricted. Okay, so here uh, you can see that relative uh, true error. Why relative true error? Because we are comparing the value with the uh, we are comparing the error associated in x with the true value of x. That's why relative true error. Otherwise, it would be a relative error. Okay, so we know the error e that is x e uh, minus x t. Okay, so here if we are finding out the relative true error e r, it can be given by the ratio of the error e and the true value x t. Okay. Now, uh, say for example, we um, it's always better understand it, uh, by an example only. So, say we have taken uh, the case in which we are doing rounding off and truncation both for um, an atomic weight of a gaseous substance. Okay say the weight of a gaseous substance is given to you and you have to estimate the error if um, the true value is obviously the true value is known that is uh, 15.9994 this is the true value and uh, uh, now you have to estimate the error that is associated with this true value if we are doing a rounding off operation and if we are doing a truncation operation. So, you can pause the video and you can solve this to check your output. The solution is in case A when you are doing a rounding off operation to 16 you will get 0 0.37 into 10 to the power minus 4 okay? and uh, when you are doing a, uh, a truncation operation you can see that how much error that you are getting it is uh, negation of 0 0.62 into 10 to the power minus 1. So, you can uh, depending upon the application, depending upon the method or the algorithm, the criticality of the application, etc., you can find out uh, that if, if this error in case A or B, if it goes on propagating, what would be its impact on the system? So, likewise, the choice can be done. Okay? Now, let us move to the measuring of relative error when the true value is not known. Okay? So, uh, let us take a very uh, practical case because practically the true value uh, to find out the ideal behavior, the true behavior or uh, the ideal outcome from a system is quite difficult um, unless you are uh, executing the system or you are executing the algorithm. But if we want to do it on a modeling part analytically if we want to study even before deploying the system or even before actually executing the process, we often go for um, the relative error not the relative true error. So, see uh, how it is defined when the true value is unknown the relative true error becomes infeasible and that is why we go for relative error which is defined uh, as uh, delta of E i. You can see here is that E i is what it denotes the error in uh, x that is our value uh, at iteration i. Okay? And x i is the computed value of x for iteration i. So, in ith iteration whatever value you are getting you have to keep track of it so that at each stage you are um, keeping a counter on the, uh, the error part. Okay? And then at the end to find out the relative error you are negating uh, you are uh, like uh, the uh, 
error that is associated in the previous uh, uh, iteration and adding it up to the error of the next iteration or you can say a difference of uh, the error uh, that, that, that you are getting in the consecutive iterations. Okay? So, with this relative error why not take an example to solve. So, in this example this is a cubic equation that we have and see without actually uh, making use of cube root we want to find out uh, what will be the value. Okay? So, here what happens uh, that uh, in this equation the second equation you can see that uh, x is uh, formulated as under root of 3 x plus uh, 6 minus 8 by x. So, this is a nice looking equation you have. Uh, now, uh, with an assumption that uh, whenever you, you do not have a true value you have to make assumptions somewhere. Okay, right? So, assumption uh, say the seed value that we have taken here is 2. Now, with this value x0 what we do we solve the second equation and we come up with the first iteration uh, and uh, the result that we have taken uh, we, we are receiving the value of x1. Okay? Now, x1 will give you after solving this equation with x0 equal to 2. Now, mind it this uh, assumption could be different in different um, studies, case studies. You can do different case studies and you will see that if you are taking uh, say for example, you are taking the seed value instead of 2, you are taking 200, then it will take uh, for you longer time to converge. It is not that you will not converge to the result, it, you will converge but you have to do uh, a lot of computational effort is like required. Okay. So, here um, we, ha we have got the value x1 and our um, previous iteration what we get we, get, uh, we have taken the initial assumption that is x0. So, e1 will be uh, the difference between x1 and x0 and, and that is our error in the first iteration. Likewise, uh, we can just go on doing the trials and you can see that as the trial increases uh, the error it also gets magnified. Okay? So, it is very important that uh, the true value when it is unknown you go for the iterative uh, uh, operations okay? Iterate in an iterative uh, way um, you will be carrying out uh, and uh, this study is particularly done with two assumptions over here. First the true value that we have assumed to be 4 and second the seed value that is uh, x0 equal to 2. Okay? So, you can see that if the assumptions are changed your entire tabulated data, your entire error analysis everything is going to change. So, it is very important that how you are uh, making choice of these assumptions as well. So, by um, end of this lecture you are aware of uh, so many things what performance is, uh, how the performance uh, can be analyzed, the analysis modes. Okay? it could be modeling, measurement or uh, simulation etc. Then uh, 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 whether error is associated with the performance or not, if yes then what type of, types of errors are there, non-numerical or numerical error. Okay? And uh, uh, what will happen when you are uh, aware of the true nature of the system and you are not aware of the true nature of the system. In both the cases we have seen how to analyze the error, the impact of error rather. And um, these are some of the references, good references, good books that you can refer to um, so that um, your concept will get even stronger and clearer with respect to computing systems and their performance analysis. Thank you. With this note, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so very much for giving us a productive session. And friends, we would be meeting again very soon and would be discussing more. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again.